Well, I don't know. Is it? It's afternoon there. Good afternoon, John, all the way from the UK. Good afternoon. I'm sitting in Cape Town. Uh, I'm here with John McDonnell, and um, John is going to give us an interesting talk that fills in one of the gaps in our series, Fighting Men of Rhodesia, and that is um, uh, the internal affairs. Um, there are a few gaps in our coverage of the different uh, uh, sections of of the army and of the war. Um, and uh, one of them is the engineers. We'd love to get some engineers on. We'd love to get some guys from the artillery. And we wanted to get someone from internal affairs. And John McDonald has very kindly offered to step up to the plate and tell some of his anecdote, anecdotes, some of his history, and some of his story of his experiences uh, in internal affairs and, and put it on the record. So, John, welcome. Over to you. Thank you, John. Yeah, it's, it's good be, to be here. John McDonald, I, I joined Internal Affairs in 1975, and I was based at head office. I'd had a bit of an accident, a car accident, so I, my leg was in plaster. So INTEF was really good to me, and what attracted me was I wanted to study law and go into the legal profession. So my mum learned that INTEF, took law exams. Um, so the first two exams were statute law one and two. Um, in fact, those were the law exams. And I think there was some some uh, uh, customs criminal law. But um, anyway, I joined in TAF. There were other exams that we had to do. We had to do uh, Shana, Shana culture and customs, African customs, and I passed that exam. Then I went on to do law and <clears throat> didn't do well with that. And it didn't agree with me. Um, all those statutes, man, learning them and how they applied and whatever was pretty heavy to pass. Um, the, the other ones that I think would have been easier if I had practiced it were learning Shona, oral and written, like like you did in GCSE or in O level and A level, which I did for M level Afrikaans, and I, I got through that. So I didn't do those exams, um, but I was in INTEF. And then uh, I was posted in January 1976. I went to Chibi. And I set a historical record in internal affairs in that we used to go uh, to our, our, we were going, if we didn't have transport, you know, government transport, we'd go on the RMS bus. So that was the railway bus with all the mail and the cattle and whatever on the back. And there was a little compartment where you'd sit. So I would have had to go to Fort Victoria from Salisbury, get picked up at the provincial commissioner's office and then go out to Chibi in the Land Rover. How long that would have taken, I don't know. But because I'd been at head office, John Roebuck was my DC and he said, no, look, this is a head office chap. I think he should fly down on Air Rhodesia. <laughs> so I was the first cadet ever to fly on Air Rhodesia to Fort Vic Airport. And they picked me up and I had my Kutunda and I put it on the Land Rover and they, and they sent me out to Chibi. Anyway, I got a hell of a shock when I got to Chibi because there were 11 uh, people on the station. There were two patrol officers, a member in charge and his constables and a sergeant. And then there was the DC, the district commissioner. His name was uh, Gumprich. So Derek Gumprich. And then the district officer was Ian Whedon. And then Yves Dangleong was the cadet too. So he was just below the DO. And what, a couple of exams, he would have become a district officer. And he spoke uh, fluent French and obviously English very well. And his wife and Ian was married. And then I was the cadet. So they meant to have two cadets and I was the only cadet. And we had an accountant. And then we had PDOs, which were uh, development officers. And um, they were, were employed by ADF, which was the African Development Fund. And they went out and they built things like dips and schools and that sort of thing and sorted out the roads. And we were the administration, okay? Yeah, so, and then we worked with the police as well. We worked with the police on ground coverage. Now, that was our district assistants. Those were the black um, um, people that worked with us. And we were all civil servants. I want to make that clear. We were all civil servants, John. So we weren't army or, or military at all, Air Force, Army. And even the police were the police. You know, um, they were under the judiciary and they weren't really army trained or anything like that. Some of them had had training. Um, some of their sergeants were ex-Rhodesian African rifles and some of the 
the officers had had some some form of training. Um, so we weren't military at all at, at that time. Um, and But one of the first jobs I got was with a patrol officer and the district commissioner wanted me to go to the very end of, of Chibi, which is a place called Nyajena. Now Nyajena is quite a famous uh, TTL in the annals of um, the Rhodesian army in that a Sulu scout convoy was ambushed there and quite a few scouts were killed. And I think Basil Moss's son was killed in that. So when I got there, it wasn't hot, but um, it's been whatever, and they used to kill each other. So this guy's wife, this a AM, which was African male, killed the AF, which is an African female. That's how they were described in it. AF, AM, um, um, AJ, African juvenile. He killed her with an axe because she was unfaithful to him when he was in Port Victoria working, and he came back on the weekend unexpectedly. Anyway, we had to go and fetch this woman's body. So I drove down there. I had a look around the crawl and that. Uh, the constables loaded it up. We had a sergeant with us as well. But we had this body on the roof and it was hot. Eh? The, the Lundi River is hot, I'm telling you, right on the border with New Nancy. So we had this body on the roof in a tin trunk and we put it in and then we drove. And I tell you, you know, there was no refrigeration. Eh? And if you put your head out the window, it was worse. So you shut all the windows, but the smell was in there anyway. I don't know how we did it, but we got back to Chibi about an hour and a half, two hours, and no, about two hours later, because we went on all these dirt roads, you know, they're almost like tracks with this four-wheel drive Land Rover. Anyway, we got back and I'd explored the southern part of this bloody TTL. And from there, I, I went on and I, I started doing um, things like cattle dipping. Um, you know, we'd, we'd, have, we'd supervise that and you know, make sure that it was going on. Um, and I'd went to cattle sales and we, the cadets set the prices for the cattle. So they would say X male and you'd look um, down in the tables and then you'd say, okay, that's $25 starting price. And then the, the commission, um, there was a commission that used to buy the beef. They would be there as the buyers and they would buy all the, the cattle that we were selling for the black Africans. And then they would get the money. They'd organize the money. Anyway, um, the cold commission was the, was the people. So um, we were doing that in liaison with them and that. And I would set the price. And then the DO would call it out. And then the, the, the sale would kick off. So that was quite interesting. And then I, I moved on and I started doing the African Development Fund. Now, that was to pay for all the roads, um, you know, grading the roads and the drivers and then um, – the people who were attached to the agricultural department, because we had agricultural officers, white guys. We didn't have one in Chibi, but other Cherezi had one when I went there. And that happened later. But I, I, I worked on those books, and I'll tell you, those they were in a mess always. And the, the little cadet got there with a the little adding machine and tried to work it out. And my maths was terrible. And I got myself really doing a car and whatever. That means mixed up. Anyway, I then moved on to designing business centers and selling the licenses. And I still got some of those letters that I, I wrote to my mom. I'm sitting in this office with an African black man and negotiating for him to put down a deposit. And he says he can only put down 10%. And mom, I've got him down to 50%. And, and I'm going into the DC's office now and see if he says, okay. And the DC said, yeah, okay, okay, just get out because he was busy. And then the guy paid his, his 50% half price and he got his general dealer store. So I was doing that, that sort of thing as well. So it got more and more interesting. And then um, my district officer um, was transferred and we got another district officer, Hugh Sumner. And then I, I was transferred to Cherezi. Now that was a real eye opener because in Cherezi now, it was 1976 and uh, later on in 1976 and um, there was Buffalo Range, and I knew the tra air traffic controllers there. So because of them, I met the Air Force. So I met Prop uh, Heldenhuis. I met Koki Benneke, Story Stevens, who was unfortunately killed in, a, in flying a lynx into Mozambique. Uh, that's another story. I was very upset about that. I'll tell you what happened with Koki, uh, with um, Story. Um, we used to have drinks together, and, and I got on very well with them. And I later on, I was transferred. But when I came back, I said to Prop, where's Starry? And he said, Starry's no longer with us. And I said, has he left the Air Force? He said, no, he's left 
you know, he's died. He was killed in a in a contact over Mozambique, and his links went in. And I tell you, I I just had tears in my eyes. I was so upset about that. Um, and it was the first guy that outside of family and that that I knew that it that it um you know had had been killed in action. Anyway, so um, that was story. But the Sulu scouts were there, and they had a fort. These big bearded wonders, and um, I met guys like Ethel Gillespie and his new guys who came out. These were the first guys that I'd met that were trained up, young guys that was training to be sergeants and do these pseudo operations. Now it was very hush hush. Um, we weren't allowed to know what pseudo was and all that sort of thing, and it was just a term that they used. And we never ever saw those those um, obviously those tame tame terrorists that were turned and worked with the Sulu Scouts or the RAR, Rhodesian African Rifles, who were integrated, you know, and they were they were senior NCOs, normally corporals and sergeants, and they worked together with one white guy up on the OP or whatever, and then the black guys went in as the tours. So it was very hush-hush. And then at that stage, Tim Bax and those guys came down and they did this first road into Mozambique, uh, and they went and they hit Mapai. Anyway, that that was very interesting for me because I was now the war was on, and um, with the Matpai thing, um, I I hitchhiked. Um, I, I took. I went with one of the Sulu scouts. He was a territorial Sulu scout, and I went with his his wife to Guelo, and I was hitchhiking, and I was picked up by none other than P K Van der Baal, the Minister of Defence. So PK showed me his little machine gun, and it was a, a, a nickel-plated thing. And he said, "John, is this any good?" So I said, "Yes, sir. It's it's, it's very good at 30 yards, but after that, you're not going to kill much with it, because <laughs> we had tried the Uzi on wet blankets at 50 yards, and it just hit it and then fell down." So he looked at me, he said, "John, oh, but this is an American." So I said, "Well, I hope it works, sir." And he had sandwiches, and and I had a dog with me, a, a puppy, and. He gave me sandwiches and the dog sandwiches. You know, it was shared between the minister, me, and the dog. And I thought, hey, this is a good bloke. Anyway, he took me his farm. He said, look, I'm taking you on to Salu, and you'll have to hike from there. But I'm taking you past my farm, drop me at Salu, and I picked up another lift, and I got to Salisbury that night. So I met I met <laughs> the minister of defense <laughs> and had, had dinner with him. And I can say that as a little rookie district junior district, uh, cadet district officer. The Cherezi scene, we we didn't have weapons and we were we were sent out into the TTL. I went with Ian Whedon and we had to pick up the chiefs and the teachers. And they didn't explain anything to us. We, we had no national servicemen or, you know, any military presence there on the INTAF side. And that, that came later. Um, and I'll tell you about that. But um, so we were sent out and there was a landmine. It was the first landmine in the Cherezi area. So we were in the in the Sengui TTL, I think it was, and uh, we got a we had a radio and they radio us and they said, listen, there's been this landmine, there could be another one down for you because we think this is for you, but a civvy truck has hit it. So um yeah, we they said stay where you are, we're sending a pookie. Well, I don't know where this pookie came from, bloody Sawsby or whatever. Or entirely, but um, we slept under this truck at night, no water, no food, with all these little kids, and the chief and his wives, and then the teachers and and their kids and their husbands and that, you know, who were also teachers. So, woman and his and the wife would, the husband and the wife would be a teacher, and all their kids protecting them. Um, it was a rough night, I tell you. <laughs> Imagine just in the shorts and a t-shirt under a truck. And it, it can get cold at night, even though it's the low felt. Anyway, the Pookie came and the army came and they they turned around and they went in front of this big uh, truck that wasn't mine-proofed at all. There were no sandbags, nothing. And uh, there were no mines, fortunately. We got onto the main road and we went back to Cheredzi and they housed these people in the DA line. So the district commission, I don't know how what they did. They never told us much, but they must have put extra accommodation in that in for these guys. Um, the war started carrying on from there. We knew that the terrorists were there. So now they gave us weapons. Okay. So I got a, I got an old SLR, um, which had the carrying handle on still. Um, used to have a carrying handle for an FN. 
and the RLR and Leisure Light Infantry, they were equipped with those. They'll know what I'm talking about. It had a wooden stock, a wooden butt, yeah. and this carrying handle. Yeah. But it had the same magazine. It was slightly different, but you could fit an FN magazine. Anyway, we went to this dip, and there, there was some national servicemen. We were sending them, and the DC was giving them a rundown of what they had to do and that sort of thing. And I was sitting there, and I was so nervous, and I was fiddling with this little button, and I pushed it, and then I pulled the trigger. Just tickled it and bang, it went off. Nearly shot this guy, this NS guy in the leg. <laughs> so they took my weapon away, like going to DB, and I thought, oh, I'm in big trouble. And they put me in the, in the, in the, it was a thing called a leopard, which had doors that shut with a VW engine on the back. So I'm stuck in there, like in jail, and I thought, well, they can't charge me because I'm, I'm a civvy. But um, the DC gave me a real blasting and then a bit of a lesson on the FN. And I was petrified to use this bloody thing. Um, I preferred the Uzi. I knew the safety catch, and it was a little thing in that. Um, so I carried that most of the time. Anyway, I, I sent out to this Rip and Guana and as a job, and I had to dip 3,000 cattle, no, 1,000 cattle in a day. I think it was 1,000 cattle. And I was in charge, and I had, I had the... The chap who was counting and doing the charging because they paid a little bit for each mummy they went through. They took the, the guy's name and we dipped his cattle. And, and the next thing I looked and I just saw some horns and this rolling and it was a yellow cow. And I stopped it and I, I had to get this out now. So I had to find some tumble, which is rope. And we had to put it around this thing's neck and nearly lost a couple of guys falling in. And that stuff, that arsenic can kill you. Eh? So it was tough, and we got this car out, and then we carried on. So we were late because of this. And then I went and I spent the night on, on the Swabi River in, a, in the DC's rest camp with these national servicemen. And they had bunkers, and they had a, just a fence. And then the river, and they had like pillboxes that they'd put in, just made of wood with sandbags on the top. And they had DAs, you know, like a proper a kyle, let's say, with brick walls and a tin roof where they stayed. So if there was a, if we were revved, and being revved in NTF means you were attacked by the terrorists, and they came with everything they had, RPG-7s, RPDs, AKs, SKSs, everything they had because they were supposed to take you out and then burn the village. So that's what they're, and intimidate us and kill us as well. So um, anyway, we, you know, you know, we would bed down. We had sandbags around where we slept, and uh, we were fine. We we didn't get hit there. And while I was there, nobody got hit. But um, what they did do is they started the PV program. Now, the Protected Village program had started in Chueshi in 1974, and um, that was it was the winter of '74. So it was around about May June, and Chueshi they put in uh, proper fences. With barbed wire on the top, they put lights in, okay, um, and they had electricity, and it was sort of like a show, show type thing, you know. The the lines were laid out perfectly for the, the African huts. The Africans built their own huts, the black people, and the, the chiefs were put in what, or the headmen in one sort of area, and the chiefs then would be protected, and the headmen would be protected, and the crawl heads would be protected, and they'd come in. And then the, the people would go out at six in the morning and they had to be back by, by six o'clock at night or last light. Anybody outside was then fair game and could be shot on site because if they were outside, they were considered to be fraternizing with the enemy or the enemy. And so if they came, try to come in, bang. And we had guys on the gate and then we would do patrol. Was this was on national service, and so this is this is what these guys were doing. But I, you know, I wasn't part of that. But we introduced that into into Chiredzi. But by then, it was just um, a wall um, that was put up with with uh, earth, and it was called a keep. And round the edge was like a walkway, a catwalk, and four bunkers in the corners, and in a, a district assistance um, barrack room. Then the the the, the Keep commanders, barrack room and radio room, operations room, and a kitchen, and a shower, and a toilet, and that was like a, just a soak away type toilet, and a, a, a windmill, um, with a tank, a water tank, and we would pipe water from the river, stick the chlorinated pills in there, and that would be our water. So they were putting all this in in Chiredzi, and they sent the army in. They sent some national service guys in who were on call up. And and or the, the tier four and call up national service guys with them, 
and they were armed with MAGs and that, and they, they guarded the guys while they put all this infrastructure in down there. So it had spread by 1976 to, to, to Redzi, and it carried on around the country. Now, this was the border, so all the hot areas, and that was the protected village uh, program. One thing I want to explain about INTERF is that we were paramilitary. We weren't military, and we were part of the civil service. So um, I don't think many people understand that, that the, the internal affairs was the African administration of the country. And the district commissioners um, held court and they tried they tried civil cases and they would have advice from, from two chiefs sometimes and the chief and the DC would agree and they'd sentence people um, for what, whatever it was, a cattle straying onto an area and destroying someone's crops for whatever. And there was this side saying that no, was their cattle and that side on his case cattle or a divorce or whatever. And the, the chief would refer it up if he couldn't solve it because the chief could try cases. And that's why we had to do the law. So we were civil administrators. We kept collected tax. We, I, I did births and death registration for, for everybody, for you know anybody that died, we'd do a death certificate. If a child was born, I'd write out the birth certificate. That fell under us. And so we were very much civilians, but um, we were carrying weapons now. And so everyone thought that that we were wasters and you know we were useless and. You know, we weren't up to the military standards and all that sort of thing. I'm sure the guys who were in the Legion Light Infantry, the SAS, the Salute Scouts will, will attest to that. Um, and even the, the territorial forces in the in the Rhodesia regiments, which were the guys who were called up to do um, frontline duties, um, patrolling and OPs and that sort of thing, they weren't considered as crack troops and they were a bit suspect. Um, because sometimes their radio operation wasn't good. And when, if they called in a, a airstrike or whatever, they didn't coordinate it properly. They didn't know what was going on. So we got a worse reputation than them, and we were looked down on. But in, in 1977, I, I went to Zaka first, spent a little while there, and in 1977, so sort of the end of 76, 77, I went and did national service, and we were all sent to Llewellyn Barracks. So... Yeah, we were um, meant to be, you know, going into the protected village program, and um, and um, you know we were at Llewellyn Barracks, so we had camouflage and we had the Rhodesia Regiment badge on and um, polishing stick boots and real army stuff and getting shouted at and doubling everywhere and I thought. I thought, hell, this army is difficult. Eh? And we had an SAS guy and a Grey Scouts and all sorts of guys shouting at us, corporals and sergeants. And um, it was tough, but I quite enjoyed it. I enjoyed uh, that cross country and I tried to win that. And I came about 129th out of 500 guys. So I thought I did quite well. Um, but after two weeks, they said, no, we've cleared space for your Chikarubi. And that was where we trained. Chikarubi is, is a prison. And it still was a prison, and we were sent up to Salisbury on the train, and they met us. We handed all our kit in, we clawed out, as the Afrikaners say, you know, we handed everything in, and off we went to Intaf. We got new uniforms, we had a new barrack room um, um, where we were put in, which was lovely. We had really hot showers, we had a dining hall, and we really, like, were elevated sort of from, you know, a massive mess with and a huge hall where the major just addressed you about venereal disease and these sort of things and to behave yourselves. And so we could drink beers as well. So it was it was quite good. On a Friday night and Saturday and Sunday could drink beers in this in this pub and the NCOs would come and join us. They they were RLI guys, a guy called Paddy Gallagher, who was a uh, ex early RLI and a guy called Bill Chalmers. And they knocked the stuffing out of us, those guys. And they treated us like, like RLI guys. You know, they, they marched us and they doubled us and they shouted at us. And when somebody did something wrong that was like a little piece of fluff or a fly had flown in with keeping pets in the barrack room, you know, all this. <laughs> We'd have to take all our beds out onto the road. And we had a lot of guys who had, one guy had a prosthetic arm, but he was a, a D-cat. He'd gone below the C-cat, C category, which was like an invalid just about. We had to carry his stuff up as well, but we did it. 
and it was raining and they were impressed. So we only had to go up to the road. The other guys had to go about, I don't know, about a kilometer to the parade square and put all this stuff out, all laid out properly. So they, they hammered us. And um, it was good, though, because um, they trained us well. And they, on weapons training, they taught us blindfolded how to strip an FN and put it back together again. And one of the things that, that Paddy Gallagher taught us on this weapons thing was he taught us to load, to un, unload and then load an FN magazine with uh, blindfolded. And I thought, yes, these RLI guys are idiots. Um, you know, why do we have to know? You know, we're just going to be running around the daytime and we'll have our magazine and that. And, you know, we'll. But he said, no, you've got to know how to do this. So I did it. And in my first contact, it was in the dark. And as the magazines, I only had two magazines, as the magazines ran out, you had to reload it in the dark. And I flipped it around. I felt for that little lip and I stuck the rounds in when that magazine was finished. And I had the other magazine in. So I had my spare and I carried on getting revved by these gooks. And this was in, in Marewa because that's where I ended up. So the training was good, and then they taught us camouflage, and we had these red bands around our hats. The, the red was, in African, is like authority. So we had these red bands, and they said they, they said to the one guy, his name was Spud Murphy, they said, Spud, dive into that ditch there. So Spud had to uh, perform this role into the ditch, and he said, now hide. And we looked all in this long grass and little trees and that. We could not see Spud, and he said, I'm telling you, if you lie low, even with a red band, the, the gooks can't see you. And if you open fire first, you're going to take them out. So that, that sort of thing gave us a bit of confidence in that. Um, and then we finished our NS. We did all this, this parade square stuff and saluting and eyes right and, and running around with your rifle above your head because you're out of stiff and you've got two left, left feet and he's going to stick his pace stick up your nose and oh geez we're frightened of these guys but anyway we got through it we got through the rifle you know going to the butts at cleveland and we were trained now and uh, they said right and we got divided up and i went to marewa and so i went to the place called mashambanaka and that was a keep out um yeah, i think in ozumba ttl tribal trust land and i was put under Aud, um, Audi Medhurst. And Audi showed me how to ambush at night around the PV to see if, you know, anyone was coming in. And, um, no, that was interesting. So he was just teaching me the ropes. I was there for about three days. And then I, I drove up in a convoy and I went to a place called Chitsungu. Now, Chitsungu was a business um, area. It had a grinding mill, a general dealer store, and that. It had a, it had a school nearby and it had a clinic. And um, I got there and, and I saw this fort. It was a tiny little thing. It didn't even have a parade square in the middle. We did the parades outside with the Diaz. We used to inspect them every day and they starched their trousers and even starched their hats, you know, and they all had different styles of hat with this red band. And we would inspect, inspect their rifles and that to show, you know, show that we were in charge. But this place was Fort Derelict. Eh? And it had like wood on top of the walls because the walls weren't high enough. It was built on, on, on a big rock, a dwala, flat dwala. And opposite it was the lookout tower and the water tower. And there was a little like bunker made there with sandbags. And we had to send a guy out there as the lookout. But he was separate from the keep. So um, that's the only time I ever saw that. The rest of the time, you know, we had a bob wire like fence that we put up and the, 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 the gate was blocked off. Uh, and the, black, the gate was like, you know, the gate came like that, went to the right and then went to the left. So there was like a wall in front and they'd have to zigzag through there with the Land Rover or Leopard or whatever. And then we put this barbed wire across. So a guy would be out there and watching what was going on. And then he had to run back into the keep if we got, a, if we got revved. Fortunately, we didn't get revved there. And I wondered why this clinic was shut. And uh, the reason what was that the tours broke in and they took all the stuff, you know, all the medicine and everything. They broke all the windows. They, they intimidated the nurse and um, you know, threatened to kill her and whatever. So she was petrified. So the, the DC just closed it down. So then the, the villagers used to come to me to treat them. And I used to give them aspirin. And they thought this aspirin, aspirin was good mutier. It could cure anything. 
But then they started bringing kids that had been injured, they had broken arms, they had abscesses, and I had nothing to treat that. So I wish that I'd done the medics course and I could have given penicillin and that sort of thing. And I asked the, the district commissioner, he told me why. So in the PV, we had all these um, different things, calamine lotion and um, various things for, I think the one thing was for treating horses who had bruises that we used to put on our ankles if we bruised them. And it was lead and opium. <laughs> and there was another thing that had a bit of opium in that the, the, the D, DAs were always sick always sick and once a week they'd all line up and you'd give them this and you realize later i only realized it makes you high <laughs> so to give them a bit of a kick you know and make them brave anyway i administered this to the to the to the africans and um i remember one day the we weren't allowed to patrol it was a frozen area because the eskimos were there now the eskimos were the silly scouts and we called them that because when it was a frozen area they were running around and that was our nickname for the silly scouts and we weren't allowed out of that camp and um, so we didn't do any patrolling or anything which was a normal thing outside of other pvs that i went to um but we patrolled around the fence and we did we did shortish walks you know maybe a kilometer out and then just looking for tracks and you know, talking to people out in the fields, you know, the nearby ones and that. Anyway, this Land Rover came through and it was a grey Land Rover, a closed Land Rover. It had a, it had a driver and two nurses in it. And the one was a, was a European nurse and the other one was a black nurse. It went through and it went about two clicks down the road and it hit a landmine. It was a boosted landmine. It, it uh, killed the driver. It killed the white nurse. And the African nurse was right in the back and she got out and she ran to the PV. And she was cut up in that. And I heard the landmine. And uh, because we weren't allowed to patrol in that, I, I didn't. I got hold of the DO at Nyakasoro. And I told him um, what had happened. And Kenny was the DO when I went there. But Nick DeFries took over from him and Ant was transferred. And I, I said, look, there's been a, a lemur mic. Um, I've got this wounded nurse with me. And there's been fatalities. And we better get someone there. So um, he went and he... He confirmed, he came and saw me after that and he confirmed this is this is what happened had happened. So now we knew that the, the geeks were running around there and it was we were gonna get hit. Anyway, I I, I went to Nyakasoro a couple of times on R and R. It was like a mini R and R that had a dam there and you could fish and um this Nick de Fries would catch a thing called a grace parrot, a little baby one, and then he had rear them and he had Zambezi lovebirds and it, it was quite a nice place. And uh, the DAs loved the radio and they'd say 363663, Now 36 was the district commissioner's office. They'd ask about their girlfriends, how their wife was doing, <laughs> you know, what was happening with the football scores in, in Salisbury. It was so funny to listen to them and they were on this thing all night. But the the you know the district officer let them do it because it made them feel good and they were the radio operator. That was one of the things that was quite funny. Um, I went with, with Nick up to a place called Dewe, and it was a, a village about, I don't know, 15 miles near a keep called Nyanzo. Now, that was the furthest keep, and that was only about 20 kilometers from Rushinga and the Missouri River. On that Missouri River, a South African police patrol went there, and they went swimming in that river, and there were about eight of them, and they were with a black constable. The only guy that got away was the black constable of the BSAP that was with them. And these other guys were killed. I can't remember the exact number, but I went to that bridge. And so the, the deer said to me, this is a hot area. And, he, and we used to listen. And Rishinga used to get revved often with mortars in it. They always hit them. But we, we got away with we Nothing happened. At Dewe, I saw people dressed in skins. The only time I ever saw that in Rhodesia. They were so primitive, these people. And we weren't very far from the Mozambique border up there i don't know maybe 50 clicks 60 clicks so it wasn't that far and it was the entry route the takawira area for the terrace they called it that and they came in through there down through the ttl to get their support and then went out from there ambushing roads in the shamba farming area etc etc so that was De dewey and um, from from jitsungu i was sent to matawa tower now matawa tower had the uh, BSAP, British South Africa Peace Support Unit there. They were called the Black Boots. They they had machine guns, they had grenades. Um, they were trained up like, like the army 
and they operated like the army and they were good soldiers. Some of, some of them were ex uh, Rhodesian African rifles as well and they put a bit of beef in there and training and experience. And they went out on OPs, patrols, um, uh, you know, went out in force sometimes to take on, on a, a group of tours if they knew how many there were. And I got wrapped up in that because they were short of guys and guys were on R&R &R and the, the support unit. And we had a, a guy called Mike Willis and he went on this OP patrol and he drank water from the river without tablets in and he got sick. So he, he was taken out of there. He actually walked out, limped out back to the PV and they called me up and they sent me there. And I had to take over that, that OP. And um, I was working with the RIC, the Rhodesian Intelligence Corps. And um, there was a guy called Sergeant Major Carl Pistorius and he was in charge. He, he was in TF then cleared up guy and he said look we've got hot in he says the geeks there and he said john if you go up there you will find them and he taught me shackles shackle on shackle off which was all new to me i knew a little bit about it i never done it so i learned all this and i was in charge so i took this patrol out and it was in the in the afternoon and we walked to where we these guys that were with me these days had been to this gomo and they said we we close we close ishe ishe meant lord or chief that was called us Ishe. Ishe, we're close. So I said, right, listen, we're going to pretend we're doubling back. And I, no one told me to do this, but I thought, I'm not walking in there now because they'll see me. And we pretended to double back. And then we we did we did what they call in the army a dog leg. But we didn't a dog leg, you know, back on the tracks. We dog leg just left up a Gomo and we, we had our meal around there and i remember these these guys they, i took the meat and the and the onions and that to make the meat part of it and they just took some marewa which is like a, a, a cabbage or spinach a wild spinach that the the black people eat and um they made the sauce they made some sauce with this and they did the studza and we ate out of this communal little pot they bought and you know their hands are, are tough eh, from working with their hands and I stuck my hands in and it burnt me in. So I had hardly any suds of that night. <laughs> I tried to gobble as much of the, the the bully beef as I could. But I was, I was scroll when I left there. <laughs> anyway, we went in and we stumbled around and I stumbled into this this crawl. And there were guys standing up there like like chatting to them, you know. And and I, I remember looking through the firelight and I remember thinking. I wonder if these bloody, you know, terrorists are here. And they were addressing the people as well. Um, so I, it looked suspect to me. But so I backed off because I had six guys with 303s and me with this FN. By then I'd, I'd collected a few more magazines. So I had five magazines now and I'd, I'd, I'd managed to purloin some chest webbing. So I pulled back and then they said right here. They looked and they said here, this is where we go the little stream and we went up and we were now in position so i had everything on the one thing i wasn't told is that i left the radio on and the battery went was nearly flat when i radioed in they're walking across from that crawl that night the my guy said they were gooks but by this stage they'd walked you know forward into this plowed millie field and i had no binoculars and i i knew about lemons because my my friends had been in the line. they said there's nothing worse than a lemon and I said, what's that? They said, you call out the fire force and they know, they, you know, there's no one there. That They're just guys going to work or whatever. So these guys might have been going out to the fields. I didn't know. But there were quite a few of them and I couldn't see their, their weapons and that or what they were carrying. So I, I radioed and, did the, and, the, and he said to me, look, I can't read you. And I said to him, look, the other thing is I came in here at night because of this dog leg and I'm not exactly sure. I think I'm in the right position. And he said, look, I can't have fire force running around there if they don't know where you are because they'll take you out. And I had flot. I had an orange smoke grenade that I could have thrown. So he said, no, nah, look, I, I changed the battery by then. He said, no, look, it's too dangerous. He said, just leave it and just stick around there and see if they come back. So we stuck around for two days. And on the, on the second night, I went down to get water at about as it was getting dark. Um, and there are a lot of rocks and trees in that. So I didn't want to be climbing up in the dark. And my guys with their rifles off safety catch into them. 
you know, getting shot at. So I went, I went down with the corporal, got the water, and two um, nannies, African females, walked into us, and we were compromised. So I raided, and he said, look, just stay the night. And he said, early tomorrow morning, just pull out, just come out of there. So I actually stuffed up that operation uh, royally. <laughs> And I wish that I'd had training with the, with the Rhodesian Light Infantry or even in the Army, exactly how to do that. And also, you know, if the scouts could have passed on some information to us, because they were very good at OPs. And if we'd had some training on when we called them in, is to identify the weapons, um, give the direction, you know, this is where they're going. If you come in behind us over my posse, I'll give it to you to the K-Car and go there. I only learned all this from reading books after the war. But during the war, we didn't know anything about that we were just on an op anyway about a week later i went out with these black boots again um in between we deployed them at night you know we would drive along and they would just jump over the side of these rls and i would be riding shotgun on these trucks with them and then i'd come back with the trucks at night and a couple of my my district assistants uh, security district assistants was was what they were called no sorry district assert district security assistance, which means they were on part-time and they weren't uh, fully-fledged members of the DC staff. They were manning the PVs and that. A couple of them, we deployed them at night. Then they said, we're going to go on a day patrol now, near to where we, I'd had the sighting. And uh, we're driving along there in an RL. The, the road was overgrown. It was where they'd gone to pick up these people to put them in the PV at Matawa Tower. And uh, this RL hit a landmine. And it hit this landmine hit the left hand rear wheel. And I and I was I was sitting behind the driver um on, on just a bench and we just had sandbags, we weren't strapped in or anything. I suddenly I heard this, you know, like muffled gah, and there was black smoke and I was airborne. And and I knew that that's the only sensation and my ears went deaf. I looked around and, I, and there was not a person on the truck. Eh? They were all blown off. All the support guys, my guys, were blown off the back of the truck. And it had lurched sideways and this PO opened fire. But by this time, I pulled my sensor together and my, my, my right leg was paining because I'd put, I had my rifle on the side of the truck and my right leg had gone backwards and hooked on the truck and that held me in place. I don't know how. And because I was furthest from the blast, Anyway, I jumped into this long grass, six foot grass. The next thing, this 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 cop is shooting over my head, these rounds and bangs, you know. And I thought this is going to kill me. If he drops his weapon, I'm dead. So I ran around the truck, dived next to the the um, the police guys and my guys. No one was firing. I actually, I actually, as I ran around, I I stopped and I fired three rounds in the direction he was firing. And I didn't have a flash hide on my weapon. And th those three shots were heard at, at, at back at, at Matawa Tower or somewhere. And they radiated and we've heard, we've heard someone shooting. His shots with a flash hide, they weren't heard at all, which was very strange, I thought. Anyway, the, the, the sergeant major in the support unit, his back was, was badly damaged. It might even have been broken. So um, the, his boss was an inspector. And he was in a Land Rover in, in the front, and he he took the back of the Land Rover, and we made a stretcher, and he put um, one of the sergeants in to drive this thing, and he um, he um, got the guy on the back with had some sandbags on the back, and he he sat on the stretcher next to the guy, and he held this 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 sergeant the sergeant major's he was a machine gunner, his head in his arms like this, he was a Christian guy, this guy, a very strong Christian, I remember, he had red hair. And he held him like this, and we drove back on the main road. We got onto the main road. He drove back to Matawa Tower, which could have been mined as well, holding this guy and just talking to him all the way. Two of my guys were injured, and the, the policeman had injured his back and was shell-shocked. I mean, he, he just went went berserk. So they those 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 guys were Kasovac. The, the sergeant, two of my guys were cut up, and the, the, the PO who had damaged his back as well and had whiplash in it. So the plane landed at Matawa Tower um, and, and took off with them. It was a, like a light aircraft, quite a big one, took off with them and, and went, took them out either to the Jock or, or straight to Salisbury. I don't know where they went. 
Uh, so that was my landmine experience. And fortunately, it was the only one, the only tin I popped <laughs> during the war. Um, from Matau uh, I, I was transferred right up to the north to Nyanzo. And that was the furthest keep, and that's near that place called Dewe. And there was an airstrip there, a grass airstrip. And I was there for a couple of months, and it was it was terribly boring. Um, couldn't go out in that really hot up there. And I, I really was like hot full of this um, being in these PVs. And I was just moved around all the time. And I found out later that uh, Dave Myram's moved you around because there were such gaps in the thing. And he, you couldn't stay under him. He was a very strict DC. If you were useless, he'd just turf you out and send you back to head office. You could go somewhere else. So he sent the guys who, who seemed to do okay to all the different places to take over because it was new guys every time. You had to discipline and they used to get drunk and they used to have ADs and bloody nearly shoot your head off and um, all sorts of problems with the, with the, with the soldiers. They, some of them weren't well trained. The corporals were very good. So I ended up there and I dislocated my shoulder. I'd had an injury playing rugby and I did that um, with Intef at Chikaribu who we were having a match against somebody, I think university fourth team or something. And I dislocated it. So now I dislocated it again. And I, I, this shoulder, when it came out, I couldn't put it back. So I, I, a light aircraft landed a day later. So I sat with the thing out in pain. No painkillers, nothing. Um, and the light aircraft landed and took me to Jock Matoka. That's my only experience with RLI Fire Force. Okay, So I'm lying there in bed. On the, on the operating table and they're coming to examine me, the, the Air Force doctor comes and he says, no, I've got to give you some sausage and so this little oral-like troop, he says, hey, sir, can I give it to him, XA? And he says, shut up. And he says, no, come on, sir. And he says, if you don't shut up, the whole lot of you get out. So the whole the whole commando just about was squeezed in there watching this, this, <laughs> this intact guy get his shoulder put back. Um, anyway, he put it back and he strapped me up and I was lying. He said, look, um, this will be fine in a few days. He says, I'm going to organize for you to go back to your PV. I thought, no, that's going to be good if, if there's a scene and I've got to shoot left-handed now because it was the shoulder. And that night it came out again. So um, I called the orderly, he called the, or the medic, he called the doctor and he gave me another shot and he stuck this back in and he said, look, no. This is not going to work. He said, this is going to keep happening. And he said, if you get into some another landmine or something land wrong, he says, you're going to be in terrible trouble. So he sent me back and I had an operation um, in Salisbury, Stanish White, fixed this, put pins in. And and then that was, I stayed at home for a while. I went up to Chikarubi a few times. Um, and then I handed in my kit and my national service was finished. And I left internal affairs because I wanted to study and I went into the management diploma. and um, I was then called up by the army. I transferred to the army. And that's my, my intef story. Great. Gee, thanks.